Ok, so, eh, vamos a empezar entonces con esta segunda plática del profesor Kitchen eh, sobre cambio climático. So, please. Thank you very much. Ok, well, well, let me say again, um, if I should start to speak too fast, wave at me, tell me to slow down. Uh, since seem to work just fine at noon time, but uh, um, do keep me, do keep me sort of on a tight rein. So, I want to talk this afternoon about the many dimensions of the problem of climate change. Uh, these are methodological in part, in part ethical, and in part to do with issues in political and social philosophy. So this is going to be a mixture of science, philosophy of science, and uh, political social philosophy. And I'm going to begin with what I think of as the easy problem of climate change. And that is, how do we answer the question of whether human practices, specifically our tendencies to emit carbon-based fuels, contributing to a rise in the global mean temperature? Well, that question has been answered now for at a conservative estimate, 20 years. Well, the answer is clearly yes, and the evidence for it is overwhelming. The mean temperature of the planet is getting warmer, and there are a number of factors that might produce that warmth. And when you look at the possible causes very closely and subject it to causal analysis, you find out that the only one that could produce the effects that we're seeing is human emissions of carbon-based fuels. And the consensus of climate scientists around the world is that it will be very hard to hold the Earth's mean global temperature from rising by two degrees Celsius. This is really from just before the beginning of this century. So that's the, that's the zero point. Um, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to prevent the mean global temperature from rising by two degrees Celsius by 2100. And if nothing is done, if we just go on doing business as usual, then the likely increases range between three degrees Celsius and seven degrees Celsius. Just to give you some idea of what this means, <coughs> the last time that the Earth was five degrees Celsius warmer than it was uh, just before the Industrial Revolution kicked in, the, there was no ice anywhere on the planet. And there were tropical conditions ranging from the polar circles uh, to one another. So we had alligators and crocodiles and uh, swamp-loving creatures all over the place. <coughs> now, if you, want, if you like to go online and play games, you can actually go to an MIT website and you can spin the roulette wheel and see what happens. And that will show you how uh, you get various things. If you introduce some fairly stringent policy for limiting emissions, or if you do nothing at all, if you let things go on the way they currently go. And the data on the rise in global mean temperature has been worked out. Unfortunately, this is, this is a very complicated business since the Earth doesn't come with neat little thermometers uh, attached to all the places and recording devices that tell you how the temperature has changed over the last uh, um, hundreds and thousands of years. So you have to reconstruct this from things like uh, tree ring measurements. But there are three independent measurements of the, uh, of the increase over the last, say, 600 years, and they give rise to a very famous graph, which has been called the hockey stick. Obviously, it's called the hockey stick because you've got a shaft that goes like this, and then suddenly you've got a blade that kicks up at the end. Uh, Michael Mann, uh, a leading climate scientist, is responsible for one of the analyses here and for giving the graph this name. Now, why has it been so very hard for people, especially in English-speaking countries, but to some extent the world over, to appreciate this fact? Well, 
there's a philosophy of science reason for that. And it was a message that Kuhn taught many of us many years ago, which is that these debates are very subtle and very delicate, and the evidential considerations are really extremely complicated. And also, there are alternative possible sources of changes in global mean temperature. And if you followed the debate, you will know about these. You'll have people talking about sunspots or distance from the sun and all the rest of it. And all that lies behind that is that, in principle, you could get a rise in global mean temperature from other causes. But when you actually do the analysis and look at the way in which the temperature has risen and the ways in which those causal factors have been present or absent, the only one that accounts for a really fine-grained correlation is human emissions, human use of fossil fuels. But of course, it's not solely a story about evidence and principles of methodology and good inference and logic. It's also about other things too. This whole dispute has been made much more difficult by the fact that there are people who have vested interests in denying this conclusion. And they pay. The Koch brothers, famous uh, uh, pair of millionaires in the United States, have paid very large amounts of money uh, in a campaign of disinformation. This is chronicled in an excellent book by the historian, uh, the historians, I should say, even though Naomi Oreskes is probably uh, the person most responsible. <coughs> Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway. And it's because of this obfuscation that around the world, people just don't get the details right. This, i said, is the easy problem. So, here are some of the excellent data compiled by climate scientists. You've seen the graph at the bottom before. Uh, the others are graphs showing various uh, measurements and how they relate to the difference in oceans and land surfaces and so on. Or done with an immense amount of scientific care and statistical sophistication. Now have those firmly in mind. These graphs are also published, widely available on the internet, in sites that get lots of hits, and they look very different. Where do they come from? They come out of the research, perhaps I should put that in inverted commas, <laughs> are, uh, done by institutes that are funded by the fossil fuel industry and by, um, by people who uh, really want the fossil fuel industry to thrive. In Britain, Christopher Booker has declared uh, climate change to be the worst scientific scandal of our generation. <laughs> and if you go to a wonderful uh, website, Hide the Decline, just Google hide the decline. You find a very, very slick and funny video with Michael Mann uh, portrayed as a uh, comic character singing a little song. Um, and in it, you get this clip of poor frustrated Al Gore going for a climate summit at the White House, no, sorry, at Capitol, Capitol the American Capitol, and it's been snowed in. There is something truly elementary. It doesn't need a philosopher to point this out, uh, but I'll point it out anyway. Something truly elementary about using snows and bad winters and all the rest of it to cast doubt on a claim about global warming. Global warming is about the global mean temperature. That the global mean temperature is increasing does not mean that sometimes it won't snow quite a lot in some places. <laughs> it's really a, a fairly elementary point, but it's one that apparently um, the people who put this, uh, these kinds of uh, pictures out think that the public they're going to reach won't actually get. Now, what this means is that if 
democracies make decisions about climate policy, then they're not likely to do the things that they need to do in order to control climate change. And remember I said at the beginning that if it's not controlled, we can expect a rise of between 3 degrees Celsius and 7 degrees Celsius by 2100. Now, we have some obvious ideas about democracy, some popular thoughts about it, that policies should be decided in accordance with the will of the people, and that the issues to be addressed should be freely debated in public. These things are reiterated again and again and again in the English language democracies, they're somewhat less um, strident in, the, in other democracies. I don't know how they are in Mexico. And so, suggestions. <laughs> okay, perhaps I don't know. Um, uh, and so, there's a huge push. You know, the people don't want it, the people are interested in other things. And I think this depends on quite a superficial view of what democracy is and why it's important. I'll confine myself to the major Anglophone nations. That, that is, I'm confining myself to the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, which has been ravaged by firefighters, by, by, by big uh, fires in recent years, uh, wildfires, and Canada. For a very long time, Canada was way ahead of the curve. Canada was the anomaly among the English, major English-speaking nations. It was the nation that was taking climate change seriously. Then something happened. They discovered great pots of oil. <laughs> Canada is now back with the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia. All of them saying, either this isn't a problem, it's a scientific scandal, or if it's a problem, it's not an important problem. There are signs in the United States that now perhaps a majority of the population are coming to see anthropogenic global warming as real. But it's still in a list of 20 important issues that the government should be crafting policies on. It still comes in at number 19. Not quite at the bottom, but the end. Now, I want to suggest that, there's, that this is a fundamental failure in what we are currently calling, and I think wrongly calling, democracy in these countries. Um, democracy is all about enhancing people's freedom. And I don't think paying no attention to climate change genuinely enhances the freedom of the voters. They go to the polls, they cast their votes, they express their preferences, but they don't express their interests. They don't vote for policies on things that most matter to them. Because most of them, there have been surveys that have corroborated this, care about the people who will come after them, not only their biological children and grandchildren, but the people who will live in the same places, who will carry on the same societies, that to which they've contributed. Call those people in uh, an extended sense the grandchildren. People care about the well-being of their grandchildren. So I have a three-tier picture of democracy. That democracy is all about freedom and equality in freedom. And that gets promoted by the involvement of citizens in decisions about the matters that affect them. And that's realized in the standard machinery of elections and votes. You don't find a democracy everywhere you find that standard machinery. That's what I want to claim. And so the commitment to democracy, and I wonder how far around the world this goes, the commitment to democracy seems to me overly superficial. In fact, I'll say quite bluntly, what I think about the United States at the moment. It is a statistical plutocracy. It's run by the rich. The rich invest large amounts of money in campaigns to get the voters to do the things the rich would like them to do. That's a probabilistic matter. 
the voters don't always go along. Sometimes they even get it terribly badly wrong and elect a black man to become president. What a mistake. Uh, but anyway, um, most of the time it works well enough, and so it's a statistical plutocracy in which the machinery of elections, votes, and the law is manipulated in this probabilistic way through the influx of money. I suggest instead we should think about democracy as what emerged in response to a very clear problem, which was the problem of tyranny. The problem of tyranny happens when the powerful people who run the show uh, get to invade people's lives. You can't get much more invasive than what's going on on the uh, top left um, because the, the axe is about to come down, or maybe it even has come down, and, so, and the head is going to be separated from a body. But there are other ways in which tyranny can be exercised, and it can be exercised even in cases in which it seems that the democracy has been secured. Look at the picture on the bottom right. Um, Hitler came to power in what was, at the time, an attempt at democracy. Now, what democracy, what motivated democracy, was the evident oppressions that power was wreaking upon people's lives. Democracy was a reaction to what I'm going to call the problem of identifiable oppression. And the problem in many contemporary societies is that we suffer from the problem of unidentifiable <coughs> oppression. There are plenty of seats, by the way. Come and, come and sit down and make yourself comfortable. I suggest to you that the children who go to the school on the top right or the people who live in the places on the bottom right or the people who breathe the air in the bottom left are having important parts of their freedoms invaded, even though they wouldn't see the issues in those terms. They are not being overtly tyrannized by their governments, but we have inherited a different version of the same problem. And in a complex world full of causal relations which it's hard to trace, it's very difficult for people to tell whether limitations on their lives and their aspirations and what they want to do are coming from. Now, the standard response to this is that the citizens can find out. They really can find out what they, what, whom they should vote for because issues are freely and fully debated in public. Uh, Milton was John Milton, one time civil servant as well as a great poet, uh, was eloquent on this. He says, And though all the winds of doctrine were let loose to play upon the earth, so truth be in the field, we do injuriously by licensing and prohibiting to miss out the strength. Let her and falsehood grapple, whoever knew truth put to the worst in a free and open encounter. Milton was very wise. He added those last few words, in a free and open encounter. The idea behind free speech is that there must be a free and open encounter of points of view, so that it will work the magic that John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor thought it would work, namely that the public on issues of social concern would be given an opportunity to hear the evidence on both sides, and because people are basically reasonable, would therefore come to the right conclusion. When democracy decays into statistical plutocracy, that isn't so. What happens is you get a barrage of money that distorts the character of the speech, giving some voices far more time at the microphone than they deserve to get. And as a result, the citizenry gets confused and does things that are against its interests and that are in accordance with the policies that the plutocrats would like to see are in place. <coughs> At the bottom of this is a perfectly sound principle of social epistemology, of methodology, if you like. 
And that is that de free debate will lead to a condition of evidential harmony. Public discussion of controversial issues will occur in such a way that at the end of the debate, the people who make their judgments will do so on the basis of the evidential support accruing to the rival positions. In the contemporary world, that is not so. Mill's idea of an arena in which voices debated these issues is a splendid idea, but we don't live in a world in which that ideal is realized. And that's why the easy problem of climate change has been made so hard. <coughs> But let's suppose we got beyond that. Let's suppose that in the next year or two, I don't know, perhaps for very bad reasons, perhaps because there was an unusual drought or a lot of heat waves or something like that, people came around to the view that climate change is real. There were still two important sources of difficulty. The first is appreciating the urgency of the situation, and the second is finding an effective solution to it. I want to talk about both of those, and those will lead me to the really hard problem. Now, some of you probably know all this already, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell, you, tell you in case you don't. Climate modeling is a very delicate and difficult business. And it's a very delicate and difficult business because although the modelers know a lot about the general factors that influence the climate. Those factors are very, very many indeed, and they're responsive to all sorts of other things like weather patterns, which also have to become part of sophisticated modeling. Moreover, the parameters that need to be set in these models are very large in number, and we don't typically have the data just to read them off observations and measurements. So how do climate models work? Well, you take some bit of the Earth's past climate as a kind of test case, and you fling in your parameters and your factors, and you see if you can replicate that. And of course, if you're choosing blindly, you'll get something that doesn't look at all like the past history of the climate. But gradually you get good at tuning these things and you get a model, a version of the model which has parameter values in it that reconstruct a bit of the Earth's past history and then you let it run. And if you do this kind of modeling, what you find is that different models select different kinds of factors to focus on. They can do these things at various kinds of scales, etc., etc., etc. There are some points at which the models converge. Usually they converge, I'm told, by modelers 30 to 50 years out. So some interval in that point. But before that and after that, they're widely diverging. What this means is that attempts to yield precise predictions about a lot of features of the future of our planet is a very, very difficult thing to do indeed. There are some obvious things that can be said. The Bay of Bengal is going to go under. The Maldives are going to go under. North Africa is going to be in trouble. Central Africa is going to be hotter. The southwestern United States is going to go through periodic droughts. Those things are pretty firm predictions. But there are lots of other things that you'd like to know that these climate models cannot give you consensus on. Sometimes they can give you probabilities, often they can't even give you probabilities. Under these circumstances, it's very, very difficult to tell people that there's a serious and urgent problem and that they have to make certain kinds of sacrifices to deal with. So, here's something that is known. That's Miami Beach, Florida, and about two-thirds of it would go under at a one meter sea rise. And on just about everybody's predictions, unless something is done fairly swiftly, a meter sea rise will happen. And the only question is whether it happens 
around 2100 or midway through the century after that. And yet Florida, actually interestingly enough, the governor of Florida recently um, made a policy that climate change was not to be taught in the science classes <laughs> in Florida. <laughs> but you see, actually this underestimates the scope of the problem, because when you think about sea rise, sea level rise, you tend to think that the sea is here and then go up to here. Right? But in fact, of course, what the sea does is it bounces around like this, and <laughs> it bounces around like this if it's risen. And climate modelers are very convinced that a rise in global mean temperatures will increase the frequency and amplitude of extreme weather events. And you can see this actually in this chart. So suppose that we've got a normal distribution of, of temperatures. Nice bell curve. Shift it to the right as the climate warms. What happens? Well, a whole lot of stuff that used to be in the old red region is now in the light purple region. And there's new red stuff that was never seen before. Now, if, as some climate models think, it's not simply a matter of global warming shifting the bell curve to the right, but actually anchoring the bell curve on the left, and pushing down a bit like this, so it goes out further to the right and it flattens, then the effect at the tails is even greater. If the bell curve is flattened, you're gonna get more uh, probability in the tails. For precipitation, the story is interestingly different. Here, what's, what, what climate models predict is that rising temperatures will rotate the curve counterclockwise, so you get more events of heavy precipitation. All of this is already showing up. This is uh, a chart of um, the frequency of extreme weather events. What you're getting from your newspapers is not simply a whole bunch of anecdotes, it's part of a real trend. So the world of the future is one not simply in which sea levels rise, but in which there are more hurricanes, more cyclones, more very severe storms. And flooding of coastal areas isn't the only problem. Much of uh, the food, the, the fruits and vegetables in the United States are grown in California's Central Valley. My own institution, Columbia University, has a very, very strong uh, climate modeling team. And on one of their models, the Central Valley basically becomes a salt marsh, becomes inundated. That means an incredible disruption of United States agriculture. <laughs> when you think about this, and some of you are probably familiar with all of these things, and all of you are probably familiar with some of them, you should think about a future world in which the snow on the mountains ra melts rapidly in the spring, causing immediate flood flooding, followed by subsequent doubts, droughts. I don't know um, how, how things work in, in Mexico. In California, um, the water supply is heavily dependent on the, the winter snowpack in the Sierra Nevada. And it's heavily dependent on the idea that that will melt slowly. If it melts quickly, it's a disaster. Flooding of any kind leads to, to contamination of water supplies. Flooding and drought lead to disruptions of agriculture. Changing climate leads to changing ecological relations among animal species and changing patterns of infectious disease transmission, and new opportunities for the evolution of new disease vectors. It also means the forced migration of human populations with social disruption. So, think about the Bay of Bengal. At some point in the next decades, about a third of the population of Bangladesh will be displaced from the Bay of Bengal. Those people will leave 
probably not having had access to clean water for a while. They will probably live in conditions of malnutrition. They will move into territory in which others are struggling to survive under the climatic conditions. They will probably be bring with them all sorts of disease vectors, some of them possibly unprecedented. That, I think, is the sort of scenario that will occur with greater and greater frequency unless we do something about this problem. So, we are and are going to be uncertain. I think there's absolutely no chance that by the end of this, of this century, it will be possible to model the climate with sufficient precision and sufficient consensus to yield serious probabilities of the events that will occur in different places. But we know already that there are lots and lots and lots of potential disasters. So I think the right way to think about this is that we have to learn to live, first of all, with uncertainty. We do this anyway. But we have to live with it and recognize what we're doing here. Our situation is a bit like that of people who are living in a city on the verge of a multi-sided civil war. If you decide to stay in the city, you cannot have any good estimates of the probability that on a particular day when you go out to forage for food or water, a particular faction of a particular army will come around the corner, um, pull out a machine gun and shoot you. That's impossible. But given that the society is sufficiently disintegrated, that there are enough factions and enough trouble and enough possibilities for social disruption, you would be very wise to get out. That's because the chances of you avoiding all of the threats are very low indeed. And that, I think, is our situation with respect to climate change. It's not any individual particular threat. It's the chances of avoiding all of them really count. Now, many people would require, would reply to what I've said so far by saying, but look, um, if you take serious policies to, suit, to get rid of these emissions and do something about fossil fuels, you're going to disrupt the economy. And that means that you're going to create another important kind of trouble for our descendants. And that is a very good point. It's a point worth thinking about. But we should also note that given the threats that are posed to the economic life, of the globe by climate change. It's not as if we can simply take it for granted that the economy will sail on as it's been sailing on, the global economy will sail on as it's been sailing on if we don't do something to solve this problem. And I should remark in passing that the economic models are probably less powerful, less precise, and less accurate and the climate model. <clears throat> but now, let's suppose that we've solved that problem too. We've got the world on board. The Anglophone world included is on board. It's a real problem. We've got to do something about it. We decide collectively that we've got to keep greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere below some level. 450 parts per million, that used to be thought rather dangerous. 500 parts, 550 parts, any of us on 550? <laughs> 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 um, we've, we're just at the moment, as you probably know, flirting with 400. We go over 400 and then we drop back again. So we've, we're at the 400. 450 might be, uh, might be doable given a really stringent set of policies. 500 would be doable. Um, 550 would have to be very unlikely to have to stick with that. 
So how are you to do something about it? Well, it's at this point that the sources of disinformation come back again. Technology, they say. We can, we can jigger the atmosphere. We can do something that reflects some of the sun's energy back into space. So we've got this, this greenhouse mechanism, which has been known, by the way, since the 19th century, that traps some of the energy that would otherwise be um, radiated out into space. Well, if we're not going to do anything about that, maybe we can stop some of it higher up by having sort of reflecting particles in the atmosphere. Um, so sort of send a lot of sulfur up there, you know, something like that. Um, that's really risky. Then there's so-called carbon capture and storage, which can actually be done on a small scale. Nobody knows how to scale it up. But I want to say something about all of these kinds of experiments. Humanity has conducted experiments with our environment in the past. When we tried, for example, to wipe out certain kinds of pests using DDT, it wasn't too happy. There's another one that is actually very salient for me for reasons that will become clear to you in a moment. In the 19th century, people decided in Australia that the native marsupials were really pests and they wanted to get rid of them. So they decided to bring in a placental mammal, the rabbit, to outcompete these primitive marsupials. And it worked. A lot of species went, marsupial species went extinct in that. And the rabbits multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. And then soon there were too many of them. And so they had another bright idea. There's a virus, the Vixoma virus, that uh, uh, infects rabbits. Let's infect the rabbits with the Vixoma virus. And so when I grew up in southern England, not just Australia this time, we we're at the other sort of end of the globe, as it were. When I used to go on walks on the South Downs near where I lived, there were all these dead rabbits all over the place, nasty, stinking corpses with flies all over them. <coughs> because the Mixoma, the Mixoma virus was actually too powerful. And for a while, it looked as though the rabbits themselves were going to go extinct. But that got controlled in place. We only have one atmosphere. I suggest that we don't do risky experiments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there tend to be side consequences. And so there's an obvious thing to do, and that is to cut back on our dependence on fossil fuels. And you know how this is supposed to go. There are these renewables, wind energy, solar energy, hydro power, and geothermal energy, the last two being smaller suppliers than the first two. Now, until very recently, it was thought that these would not be able to supply the world's energy needs on anything like uh, the, the scale until the end of the century. But here, actually, technology has kicked in. And people I'm, I've talked to about, especially about solar energy and storage devices for solar energy, are telling me that the prospects now look much like that. And so it's quite possible that we can now devise a plan to reduce energy consumption and combine that with introduction of wind and solar energy on a relatively large scale to put the global energy budget on a diet in such a way that we can keep the, 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 the concentration of carbon equivalents in the atmosphere to 450 parts per million. Some climate scientists are saying now that that's possible. Others, Jim Hansen prominent among them, are saying it's not possible and that we will still need nuclear power as a stopgap. So there's debate on that. But that's not the way things are going. Nuclear power is one of those issues that captures the public's imagination. Even though 
the impact of nuclear power on human death and disease is minuscule in comparison with the expected impact of climate change. One of the surprising things about the aftermath of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was that when people went back and looked at the, those who had been in those cities and survived, or in the, in the area where the blast, the radiation from the blast affected them, when those people were looked at 30 and 40 years later, they had, to be sure, higher rates of cancer. But they were not dramatic. The sorts of episodes we're talking about with respect to climate change can really be expected to kill people on orders of magnitude larger scale. Now go back to the points I made about democracy. How, are we, how is it possible to persuade the world that nuclear power might be a better stopgap option at a time when those campaigns of information and disinformation that fill our political life and that have so, uh, I, I, I would say, corrupted our democracy are in full swing. We can't expect that to happen. And one of the really saddest things of recent years is that in the wake of the Japanese uh, um, nuclear um, breakdown, Fukushima, the German government, one of the governments most attentive to trying to replace uh, fossil fuel energy with renewable energy, decided to shut down its nuclear program, which was seen as avoiding carbon-based sources, and retreat to a very cheap energy source, a very cheap and a very bad one, coal, which is responsible for um, you know, a very quick and very enduring and very large amount of carbon concentrations in the atmosphere. But go one stage further. Suppose it were publicly accepted that even if necessary, we'd do nuclear power and we'd have a full-scale effort to make the world dependent on renewable sources of energy. Can we fashion a global agreement to use renewable sources? And bring in nuclear power where we need it, and go on the fossil fuel diet. Well, if it were just a matter of the affluent nations of the world, that might be workable. Those nations can afford that. They could afford to do it. They could make the substitutions. If all the world were as affluent as, say, United States, Canada, Australia, Britain, Western Europe, etc., etc., then it would be relatively easy to do. But it's important to look at the ways in which the contributions to carbon in the atmosphere have been, have been changing since early 2000. So China's gone way up. You knew that. India is going way up. The United States is declining slightly, nowhere near enough declining slightly. And so you might say, well, you know, China will eventually become a rich industrial country, and they're, they're, they're already investing in, in renewable resources, and uh, um, so the Chinese will be on board, they'll be a little bit behind the United States, but if we look into the future, if we look, say, into the 2020s or the 2030s, the Chinese emissions will tail off, and India will perhaps be a bit later, be 2030, and then its emissions will tail off. But that's to forget about large numbers of countries that are dying for development, and that turn to cheap coal because their governments want to have electrical powered industry and they want their citizens to live in conditions where they have access to electricity more than sporadically. So I said the German um, retreat to coal was one of the sad things of recent years. Another was 
the Prime Minister, current Prime Minister of India's declaration that he would supply electricity to his country by increasing the number of coal-powered uh, electricity generating plants. Modi has committed himself to that. Yet a third was the decision by the government of Bangladesh, a country which is on the front lines of the effects of all this, to build new coal-powered electrical generators on the edges of some of its last remaining forests. That's the double whammy because, as you probably know, forests are pretty good at absorbing carbon. So you lose twice over. That shows how desperate the underdeveloped parts of the world are for development and for energy. So, here are the sources of the really hard work. Many developing nations need to increase their energy use. The economically most efficient way for them to do that is to use fossil fuels, and specifically coal, and in some cases extremely dirty coal. Without extensive aid from the affluent world, they cannot afford either the technology underlying renewable sources of energy or a nuclear substitution. The money that, would, that it would cost to make the entire globe uh, available, uh, dependent solely on renewable energy and able to develop is less than two thirds of the United States military budget. An undergraduate, of course, I taught uh, with Evelyn Fox Keller on the issues surrounding climate change, went away and did the research and calculated. So two thirds, two thirds of the United States military budget, um, cut over a period of um, you know 10, 20 years. But in the context of the last report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, when the uh, developed affluent nations were asked to increase their aid for development of renewable energy in the developing nations. They, led by the United States, declined to do so. So it's not gonna happen. And why should we expect, in this game of chicken, the developing nations to back down? They have an elementary argument from justice on their side. The argument is this. You can think of the atmosphere as if it were a whole bunch of boxes or cubby holes right, into which stuff can be put. And you can imagine that each nation gets allotted a box or a number of boxes proportional to the size of its population. And now it can put as much carbon in as will fit into the box that it's been given. Well, it's no surprise that the nations that went through the Industrial Revolution first have already overused their boxes. They are, they are, you know, they have, they have taken up far more than their share. Far more than their share. So now there's a little bit left. So how should we divide it up? The developing nations say, well, look, you've had it. <laughs> you've done your thing. I mean, we should have a, a, at least a bit. And perhaps the affluent nations will say, well, we didn't know. So let's look at something else. I mean, it's not clear that, that not knowing gets you off the hook. Yeah. But let's just look at what they've done for the last 35 years since this effect became seriously numb. They've still overused their share. <laughs> now I bring this, make this point up, bring this point up because it's so obvious. This is, I mean, there are lots of subtle questions about justice. And philosophers are very good at all sorts of fancy dilemmas about what it, what it would be right to do in this and that. This is not a difficult situation. What's more, it's not a difficult thing for the people who are going to suffer 
if they are told that they have to give up development in the name of a global policy, are likely to accept. They can see very, very clearly what's been done and what's been done at their expense. So I think that both as a moral imperative and from a practical point of view, the only thing that will resolve this is for the affluent nations of the world, not simply to go on the diet that they need to go on in the consumption of their own energy, but also to make transfers of funds to the non-affluent world to enable people in the non-affluent world to develop, to have uh, an energy, or a modern energy-based economy that is based on renewable fuels. That's the solution. And I think, deep down, everybody who's in the serious business of shaping climate policy knows that that's the solution. And now I want to go back to the beginning and all of those considerations I raised at the beginning. So, even if the easier problems are solved, the only solutions to the really hard problem that are politically acceptable in the affluent world are those that deploy market mechanisms. I have listened to so many talks by economists and other people interested in climate policy who have an economics background who say, well, we've got this great model and it shows that we can do it all with a carbon tax and that will get everybody into line. That works when you play a two-player game, one of the players is the West, the other player is China. <laughs> it doesn't work when you also consider India, Indonesia, Brazil, Africa, most of the rest of Asia, blah, 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 blah. Now, the only solutions that are politically acceptable in the developing world are those that are not too far distant from the just solution. Give us the money and let's develop. We'll play along, we'll do the renewable energy thing, but we can't do it. It's economically unaffordable. <coughs> All right, so how do you get beyond this? This is where I come back again to the beginning. Remember, we're talking here about nations that are, many of them at any rate, quote, democracies. But they're democracies in which People do not like to be told that they have to make sacrifices, one. And two, in which a campaign of disinformation has had astonishing effects in preventing even the easy problem from being solved. How do you think it would play in United States politics? in British politics, in Australian politics, in Canadian politics, in politics in many other countries. If the taxpayers in those countries were told that some of their tax revenues had to go to um, support renewable energy in distant parts of the world. In all of these nations, the million arena, the conditions of the million arena are not really met. And without those men, it seems to me that we are in for a very, very, very long struggle if this solution can be accepted. And we don't have that much time. That was the point of the roulette wheels, of course, at the beginning. If we continue business as usual, then uh, the atmosphere will just contain more carbon, the planet will just heat up. And the carbon, many of you probably know this, does tend to hang around for a very long time. <laughs> and so it's not just the future at the end of this century we're talking about, it's the future 200 years hence. I would like to think, I said along the way that democracy is a work in progress, and it is. I'd like to think, and this is where link to this morning, Dewey and pragmatism comes into play. I would like to think that um, Dewey's idea of democracy is something that is constantly being forged and forged anew to come to play here. And that before it's too late, we can put into place serious international institutions that can shape and then coax the world 
into a solution that can then be enforced. But it's the only planet we have, and in my view, we have run, are running very serious risks of losing it. Thank you very much. In, in the part of the democracy here, uh, this is uh, the issue of constitutions to protect the minority, especially. And uh, if we uh, look at how children and uh, youth are treated, they're basically uh, deprived from the right to vote because of a variety of reasons. But we call uh, imagine alternative proposals as assuming that in, in or giving them a, a vote on on certain preference like in not having to pay huge amount of money in the future to uh, in, um, let's say in replace or, or uh, in fight climate change, adapt to climate change in uh, so it, and climate change is basically is also not the only problem where we're living really at the cost of the future generations. And you mentioned that the economy could in, uh, have the same problem, but there's the issues of of in, uh, state debts in that. Mm -hmm. And this is a very clear case that we are in uh, really living at the cost of future generation. I mean, the politicians that said we we will not spend more money than we're Mm -hmm. getting in and we are hearing this promise for uh, I think over 20 30 years by now and uh, so so I was wondering about your opinion on uh, what power what potential constitution that are saving let's say minorities and uh, if constitution could save let's say future generations as a permanent minority interest yeah I mean look this seems to me that there's we've got to change our thinking about how we look at uh, future generations. I mean, there's a way that economists tend to think about this, which is very influential on policy, and that's they, they do everything on a, on a so-called discount rate. You probably know this, yeah. right? So what you do is you, um, you say that $1,000 now is worth um, uh, some fraction of that, um, some decades or a century hence, and the, the extent of the decline depends on, on how high the discount rate is. Um, now, it's, this seems to me just an entirely wrong way to think about it. Um, the way to think about it seems to me is that we, we have obligations to future generations. It's not that we, that, that we are discounting things. We, from, the, from the start, we have to view their predicament as something that is important. And this, I think, is along the lines of what you were suggesting about forms of protection. So part of political thinking has to have built into it the idea of preserving the state for future generations. So it's no longer a question of discount. It's a question of asking what likely conditions they will face and what likely resources they will have to deal with it. It's a different way of looking at the problem. So you have to, so the models, the, the model that comes into play is not a discounting model, but rather a model of growth under various scenarios. And then a model of climate model prediction, so far as it can be made, um, of the conditions that they will face. Now, both of these models are highly uncertain. And under those circumstances, there's this, I think, that's right about the precautionary principle. Given the vast uncertainty, both about the future course of the economy and the conditions that these future people will face, I think we do well to try to avert the most severe effects of climate change. It's a very, it's in a way, it's a very conservative strategy. You know, the alternative thought is to say, well, they're going to be, you know, the economy will grow, even if we do nothing about climate, which I doubt, since uh, 
given the evidence that I gave earlier about the frequency, the increased frequency of extreme weather events, etc., 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 a vast amount of money is going to have to be spent uh, responding and reacting to those. Um, the economy is going to grow. They're going to have more resources than we have. They're going to be able to adapt. And that seems to me to be uh, a mistaken view. But at least that's the right way to look at it, rather than thinking simply that we just discount. So from the beginning, they are, the future generations are regarded as full parties to a kind of social contract that we make. That's what I want to say in response to your question. I don't know how to implement that politically, but, uh, but that's, that seems to be the right um, ethical and political or philosophical attitude. Fabricio? Oh, well, thank you very much for your talk. I really appreciate it. I just wanted to know if you have something to say about this architecture of the global institutions that you are proposing. Basically, there are several modern models like, for example, eco-socialism or ecological economics mm -hmm. that will uh, take you to a different path. For example, uh, ecological economics will have a commitment with the uh, growth of, in terms of economic growth that is not is zero basically, it's an, and a populational growth of 1.2, and eco-socialism is much more radical. So I just wanted to know if you will endorse one of those models and... Well, so actually I'm in print on endorsing something that may be, um, may be a part of the, the eco-socialist platform. Um, it seems to me that there is um, an analog of the ecological notion of the carrying capacity of the planet which is the, um, the number of members of our species that can be, um, for which we have the resources to enable them to live um, lives in which they can flourish and, uh, and find meaningful work and, um, and live happily, happy and fulfilling lives in community with others. Whatever that number is, we need a mechanism, a global mechanism, for making sure that there is that that, the, that that number is not as it were reached. So, um, I mean, that strikes some people as a horrendously um, awful idea. Um, but I'm, I'm 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 prepared to defend it. Now, is that um, is that is that along the lines of the now? How this gets implemented <coughs> politically, I think, is really tricky because we as as you're surely well aware, our existing international institutions have been good at only doing a very small number of things. And I think we need to craft much better ones. There is um, a political scientist, um, David Held, who's written a lot of books about global institutions. And he seems to me to have some promising ideas. Uh, one of them being that you never, never, never Vest any kind of completely limiting power in any nation whatsoever, no matter how powerful it is. So the the Security Council veto is a um, is a strong um, violation of that idea, and that seems to me actually something that's, that's very important. But look, I mean, this is this is so hard, and we have so little time. Uh, that seems to me the there's another side of what um, of what you're saying that, that that resonates with some with part of um, talks I sometimes give on this issue that I left out of this one, which is actually that human lives may might actually go much much better if we made the kinds of policies and did did the kinds of so-called sacrifices that. Um, that, are, that, that these um, policies call for. Um, I guess I'm very much moved by the thought that what we need is not vast numbers of material goods, but opportunities to choose our own way, to have opportunities for meaningful relationships and participation in community with others. Um, a safe environment, a chance to preserve our health, 
um, that took the chance to develop bits of human culture uh, and meaningful work. You know, I mean, those things seem to me very, very important. And I think we can have all of that, and possibly we can have it in better forms than we now have it, uh, if we commit ourselves to some global cooperative program of this kind. Uh, I think what we sacrifice are the meaningless toys. Um, and, but getting the public to see that is perhaps rather difficult. Maybe I sound like a, a thoroughly romantic. <laughs> 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 Uh, you say that the solution is the uh, energy substitution, yeah. but uh, and also energy reduction and reduction. The problem is uh, how we can do it uh, when the the oil industry, uh, for instance, in the United States, they they have announced that they are going to be autonomous in oil production, mm -hmm. and there is a war between Saudi Arabia and the States now, and lowering the prices of oil. And uh, Mexico is uh, pretending to be uh, to have more oil, and everybody is thinking on exploiting natural resources and not in substituting energy. Yeah. Uh, how can we do to public opinion? Drift. Uh, how can we? I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I just don't know. I mean, it seems to me that it's got to be a combination of making the consequences clear to people, and at the same time, this and this relates to what I just said to the previous gentleman, trying to trying to convince them that life could be better. I mean, I, I actually think Americans um, live pretty miserably for the most part. Um, I think. I think life in the United States is, for most people, very unsatisfying. Um, but getting them to appreciate that is, I mean, there's sort of consciousness raising, seems to me. Consciousness raising in the old fashioned 60s. But look, you're absolutely right. The, the, this, um, this, we're, going to, we're going to take all the oil out of the ground we can and as quickly as possible approach is, um, uh, is rampant at the moment. And what you do for nations that are just completely dependent upon oil, see, that's another part that seems to be another part of the support story. You've got to give them other options for development. You can't just say to Saudi Arabia, we're taking it all away and we're writing you off and all your people can just sort of uh, fall into poverty. So the world, in a certain sense, has to be retuned to deal with this. And that's, that's why the problem is so hard. On the other side, some countries seem to be preparing to to energy substitution. For instance, in the auto automotive industry, they are thinking in Germany and other countries of electric cars. And Germany has been cars. very good on this. Denmark has been fantastically good on it. I mean, there are these, uh, these ventures that are going on in Denmark in which uh, wind energy has been introduced and which uh, um, there's this little island off the coast of Denmark, which not only is, is completely self-sustaining in terms of wind energy, but also supplies <coughs> energy back to the mainland. But there are lots, 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 and lots, and lots of great um, ways to do this, um, actually. And, but it's got to be done globally. And what lies at the bottom of this is the real need to enable um, the potential polluters, the potential emitters um, all around the world to choose a different path to develop it. And that, that will cost. Um, just one more yeah. thing. Uh, um, many people have said it, that we, we need to rethink the idea of growth because uh, mm -hmm. it's true that uh, underdeveloped countries try to, to grow more than uh, they have right to grow. But uh, it's impossible now because we have only one planet, as you have said, and uh, having the same rate of growth as the, as the states is impossible. We need two more planets for doing so. Uh, so uh, we need a medium point between you know, growing I, much I, and uh, See, I actually, you scratch me, and what you get is either John Dewey or John Stewart Mill. 
Um, and this this particular itch is going to give you John Stuart Mill. So Mill wrote, <laughs> wrote the Principles of Political Economy, which went through, I think, seven editions in his lifetime or something like that. And in the Principles of, of Political Economy, he confronts a, a pro, an economic problem that uh, had been around really since the time of Adam Smith. Adam Smith says, you know, keep the economy growing and the workers will, the workers will be will enjoy the liberal reward of labor. They will all be, you know, their, their, their boats will rise, right? et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, then people start, people like Malthus come along and start talking about population, and the, you know, the, the inevitable, the inevitability of poverty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the economists of the early 19th century have this thing called the stationary state. The stationary state happens when the economy stops growing. And in a remarkable couple of passages in Principles of Political Economy, Mill says, you know, stationary state isn't so bad. Because actually we don't really need economic growth. What we need is a situation in which the resources that we have are distributed well enough so that individuals are given the opportunities for pursuing their own good in their own way. That's his, of course from On Liberty much later on, but that's the sort of thing he has in mind. I think that's dead right. I think that sentiment is dead right. To create the conditions under which um, meaningful and fulfilling lives can be, um, can be given to the widest <coughs> number of people does not require you know, vast amounts of, of energy usage as long as we stay with it, as long as we keep the population so I actually think that, that, that theoretically all of this can be done to make a much, much happier world. The trouble is getting there. And you just pointed to some things that are standing in the way of getting there. And that's that's really that's really the theme of my talk. You know, there is actually a way to solve this problem. The hard thing is to see how on earth in the world as it is today we get. There. It seems to me that the big governments of the world have forgot about the Kyoto Protocol, for example. But when you show us the graphic where the missions of China and yeah. India are way up in the last 10 years. So my question is, why aren't we Rather than reduce or searching for for ways to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions, why aren't we founding or developing the development scientific information of technological development that help us? to contrast the levels that, that there are now in the atmosphere and the planet. Uh, I'm not sure I quite understand. What do, what do you have in mind by this? Um, yeah. So the question is when you point that the solution is energy substitution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but why there aren't the universities centers of scientific research, of technological, technological research, ways to read is the contrast the levels that of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's that word that, you, that, that I don't understand. What the levels of carbon dioxide have? Reduce the levels of carbon dioxide? Okay, there are there are attempts to reduce the levels of carbon dioxide. Carbon capture and storage is, is is prominent among them. The trouble is that, and there are institutes that are working on this full time. It's incredibly hard to do it on a large scale. You can do it on small scale. But you you mentioned the Kyoto Protocols, and you might say, well, would the world have been better if the Kyoto Protocols had been accepted by everybody? In and the answer is yes. That's that's surely true, but it probably wouldn't. That probably would not have been enough. 
it's certainly not enough now to go back to them. And there's not, nothing like that way of proceeding. I mean, that way of proceeding is like saying to the people in this room, uh, we've got here for you uh, one pizza, and you'll be here for the next day. You guys figure it out. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, you've got to have, what you've got to have is a sort of detailed solution that will work out. See, the, the real form of the solution here is a year-by-year -year energy budget for the globe and a division of that across the nations that is compatible with um, development in those countries that are yearning to develop. And that, what that requires is conservation measures and returning to various kinds of simpler ways of life on the part of many nations, and also substituting uh, energy sources as quickly as possible. But if, I, I mean, I would love in a year's time, five years time, to come to a place and give a talk on this and say, here's the way it works. This is what this country gets in 20, from 2020 to 2025. And this is what it gets from 2025 to 2030, and this is the this is the rate at which it's uh, uh, it, it's a substitution of renewables feasibly can go, and this is the conservation that's required, and da, 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 da. that's that's the form of the solution. Now, that solution can be could be implemented if it were just a world of affluent nations. I mean, every people are now convinced that we can get enough out of wind and solar to make the nuclear contribution, if any, pretty small. Uh, so you could do that. The problem is you've got to combine doing that with also allowing the much greater energy requirements that are going to be required for development by those parts of the world which reasonably want a standard of living that, I mean, we're not talking here about going back to, to log cabins and you know, and no heating. <laughs> what we're talking about is actually simplifying lives by throwing away some of the unnecessary things, but not throwing away, for example, the benefits that come to us from having a ready supply of electricity. That might come in later on. That might be radical, 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 even ecological socialism. But, but um, it's not at that stage. Who's that? Yeah. Well, I guess this is more a comment than a question. But this idea uh, of affluent nations giving money to, to developing countries, this sounds very good, but I can see lots of different practical problems of yeah. how our, uh, uh, we need uh, international global institutions that. That's Precise, awesome. precisely. If you if you sort of start shelling, throwing the money into some some <coughs> of the nations in some parts of the world, it will disappear and then quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly. Thinking uh, about governments in developing countries, I can see lots of different problems like so that's why you need international institutions that, 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 will, that will oversee this. Yeah, but on, on the one hand you have these global institutions, on, on the other you have the corporations, and in probably the same way as the United States is ruled by plutocracy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, corporations are ruled in, ruled in the world. Um, the case of Mexico, for instance, is an mm -hmm. exception. Mm -hmm. We had a energy reform last year. And by energy reform, that doesn't mean that, that the government was thinking about like new technologies, <laughs> renewable <laughs> energy, nothing of, of that sort. No, they were thinking uh, about giving uh, oil to big corporations. Yeah. The, the pressure <coughs> of some of these corporations is so... I know. And they're so powerful that uh, 
Well, if it comes down to <laughs> yeah, quite look, a bit of look, look. I mean, this. What can I say? Um, if the problem is going to be solved, it's going to be big because there are going to be international institutions big enough to tame those corporations, and it's perhaps going to be because of a change in consciousness that leads even the corporations themselves to say, um, you know, belching this stuff out and living, and, and in consequence, living in a palace just isn't worth it. It's not the way I want to live. But making that, making that switch in understanding, I mean, will we do it until there's a catastrophe? The trouble is, because carbon hangs around so long in the, uh, in the atmosphere, there's no miner's canary. You know, miners used to take this bird down the mine, and then, then if, the, if the bird went, <laughs> you know, it was, uh, it was not too safe down there, it fell to the air. Well, we don't have one here, because by the time the canary goes, uh, the stuff's in the atmosphere, and the, the planet gets hotter and hotter and hotter. Um, look, I'm sorry to be flip on a serious subject, but you know, a little bit of gallows humor is probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yes. uh, sorry, I, 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 don't, I don't quite agree with the idea with the proposal of global institutions. Well, I thought you might not. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> they are not free of uh, of corruption risks. Oh. And, uh, but uh, I wonder why not do to promote your idea of a well-ordered science, something similar, where uh, in, in, in institutions, plural institutions, with representation, uh, with, an, uh, uh, with equity, mm -hmm. e equity in the sense of doing. I mean, it's not e equality, it's positive considerations of all interests. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I am a little bit worried because you you have a little bit uh, renounced to your idea of well or the science. No, no, it it no, seems no. to be very, very suggestive, no, no, very no, interesting. No, 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 I'm still a believer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> why, not to, why not to promote this same idea, something similar, uh, in, in, in solving this problem, <coughs> in trying to, to make a, 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 a just distribution of risks, a just distribution of problems. Uh, uh, but with represent positive representation. I mean, democracy in this kind of. Uh, no, I'd, love, I'd love to see it happen. I trust. I'm, I'm but just, sorry, why do you think that global institutions are more likely to solve the problems than some kind of? But aren't you envisaging a special yeah. kind of global institution? No. I mean, I thought you were envisaging a kind of. Uh, oh no! I mean, uh, be, 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 you know, besides uh, United global, Nations, no. A, global, a kind of version of, of what we already have, the United Nations, in which people. But you know, possibly cleaned up in various ways. But, <laughs> but even so, it seems to me that that's not been not been effective enough. That's that's I mean, that's it's, uh, that's I mean, that's, look, I mean, what we to use an obvious analogy, this is this is the time for um, it's a time of crisis, and, and we don't have enough time to get the that kind of conversation. I think tuned to the degree that uh, would need to be tuned to solve the problem. But look, I, I mean, in a certain sense, I'm, I, I appreciate it as a, as a suggestion. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that what I, what I see myself as doing, doing is developing a different Dewey thing, which is the theme that as, we, as democracy evolves, we come to see more of ourselves not as citizens of a particular nation, but as citizens of the world, as members of Homo sapiens. Okay, that I think was Dewey's was a, a deep thrust in in Deweyan democracy. Uh, I think he was. I think I think he was really um, suspicious of nationalism, nationalism and its concerns, and. And I think, and I share that. Now, whether that can be developed in time in a way that would, uh, would avoid, as you say, I mean, the problems of corruption have been there in political philosophy. Um, 
Ever since people stopped believing that when the rulers were going up out of the cave and saw the form of the good, they would automatically not only know what to do, but also be motivated by the good and the good alone, right? I mean, once we gave up that fantasy, the, the, the problem was, was, was always been there. And uh, it's, of course, going to be, it's going to recur with any way of trying to do this. But in response to Gustavo's question, it does seem to me important to realize the levels of, of difficulty that are involved in introducing foreign aid for good purposes into all sorts of countries, and that's got to be done with oversight, even if the people who are doing the oversight are also uh, at times um, you know, are liable to corruption. I mean, who guards the guardians? Well, um, you, you have an infinite hierarchy. Of, uh, but the truth of the matter is let's be completely pragmatic about it. We know that in certain cases, the, the, these countries are so bad that if, if it was simply the then this I think was, was a strong motivation for you saying what you did, but that simply just giving them the funds and saying, now, now do your renewable energy thing would be utterly ineffective. So you'd have to have an, an oversight point. Yeah. See? Oh, well, this question has to do also with the the conference in the morning. So, um, I'm going to start relating it to what you talked about in the morning uh, and then relate it to this. Um, when you gave your your talk, you said that uh, teleology was something that you didn't want to include in, in this conception. Uh, maybe because teleology has a bad name. It has been linked to uh, theology and 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 Dewey is is, a, is someone that's very interesting in, in that sense because mm -hmm. he he states that he wants in a sense uh, science to be teleological in a sense uh, and uh, he has a, a very interesting article related to evolution in, in which he, he also talks about um, you, you mean the importance of Darwin for philosophy yeah best article written on Darwin between 1859 and 1959 yeah and and that's uh, and that's an article that's uh, that's a, a very important uh, uh, that's a background for a whole article no? I, I don't know if you read that but it's interesting that's a question I have but uh, do we defend it theology in sense in in science no in terms of, of evolution there's some things also that's related to his standpoint against creationism that also has some complications but he also he thinks that this idea of a purpose in science that has to be goal oriented you know, in some way as i understand it that would be a question I would understand that he, in some way, defends teleology. No? So, but that's my first question. No? What do you think about okay. do we, in, in terms of teleology, no? and how do you inter interpret him, no? and how do you interpret teleology in that sense? And the other thing is, doesn't that, that have to do with what we are talking about? In some sense, don't we want to have uh, goal-oriented uh, science that, uh, in some way, <coughs> is very <still> logical. <coughs> okay. So look, this is this is complicated. I think that there is there are two notions of progress that one can have. One is a notion of progress to, and that's explicitly teleological as a goal. You're traveling somewhere and you make progress by diminishing your distance to it. There are other occasions in which I think that uh, we make progress, but there's no teleology in that sense. In medicine, I think we make progress by solving people's practical problems. There's no ideal of human health of which we are aiming. There isn't, what would human, what would perfect human health be? How long would we live if we were perfect? Um, so, I think you can have progress without teleology and it's problem-solving progress. But, there always has to be what I'm going to call an immediate goal, and what Dewey calls an end in view. 
that always has to be there. In, because that's necessary for the diagnosis of the problems in the current situation. You see your situation as problematic because you see it as lacking in something, and what you see, the thing in which you see it as being lacking is, as it were, the immediate goal, the thing that you're trying to do. This goes back to what I said to Ambrosio this morning. I now think that well-ordered science is not a teleological thing. It's something that enables one to come to terms with the problems in the immediate predicament, to recognize them and to see how to solve them. And I think that's, I think what I'm doing here is simply executing, it's explicating things in Dewey in a modern way. It's exactly the same with respect to climate change. It's not that um, we have some ideal of what our descendants' life is to be. But we have certain views about what's valuable in our own lives here and now, the things that might be lost in their lives unless we do something about it. And so we make an immediate goal of trying to preserve those things. So again, there's, you can have a progressive social and scientific development, and with luck we'll get one. Uh, and you can have that without any thought of teleology. Teleolo if Dewey had been thinking about teleology with respect to science, he would have thought that the aim of science was to come to something like a final theory. Like maybe we'd never get there, but there would be some sort of final theory. He didn't think about that. He thought, I think of science as open-ended, constantly accumulating knowledge, useful knowledge, and solving problems. Similarly, when he thinks about ethics, he doesn't think teleologically. He doesn't think that there's some final ethical system out there to which we're aiming. Uh, he thinks that what we do is we refine our ethical views by solving things that are problematic. And we use various ideals as diagnostic devices. So I want to be, I want to say this in the context of well-ordered science, I want to say it in the context of natural science, I want to say it in the context of ethics, and I want to say it in the context of climate change. It's the same story all, all the way around. I would say it's non-teleological, but it does have this idea of an end in view or an immediate goal. So what would be the key element to differentiate between <coughs> teleology only conceived as an end view perspective and a non-teleological progress? What, what would be the, the key element to differentiate between well, so in, some, some in, would interpret that in, teleological. In, in non teleological progress, what you're doing is you're trying to achieve to get as close as possible to a fixed end. In progress from or non teleological progress, you recognize certain features of your situation as problematic and try to amend them. But you have, you, you have two things. First of all, you the things that are your immediate goals may well change as you move to the next stage. That's a very durable thought. And secondly, you have no general conception of an ideal state in which you're hit. What you're trying to do is simply make the existing state better. But would you, this would be an example where we have clear general objectives in, in the case of climate We do, change. we do. We have we have an objective of trying to prevent the temperature from getting too hot, from trying to get too many people from being flooded, from having sort of too much disruption of, alpha, of agriculture and so on. But we don't have, as it were, a sort of positive vision of, of humans living in perfect harmony on a world that is exa exactly suited to supply them with their, their needs and so on and so forth. We've got sort of various partial visions that guide our, that guide our, our current diagnoses and our attempts to make them better. <clears throat> it's, all, it's all much more piecemeal and piece bitty. I mean, think about the great teleologists, you know, the state withers away and we, we now have a, a single class society. And that's, that's the goal, that's the end of history. Um, various other people, you know, Augustine has a different vision of teleology. As you say, it's explicitly religious. Um, okay, la última pregunta de Alejandro. No, it, it might be helpful to think of a person's idea of progress as an asymptotic oh. idea. 
But but it is not piecemeal social engineering. I mean, no, 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 I mean, there, there's, there's a relatively broad vision in, in terms of the climate change issue. I mean, there's, there's a lot of features of our planet that we want to preserve, I think, for our grandchildren. It's another pragmatist view of progress. <laughs> yeah. Versus. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, I'm, but, but here I, 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 I part company with Perse, and I joined you. <laughs> As I understand him, which maybe, I have to confess, isn't the right way. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.